Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Michael Aron. Hey, Michael, how are you doing? Great, Maddie. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. So at this point, normally I would introduce you to our listeners and viewers, but you have been a guest so often, you're practically a unofficial co-host. So I think people <laughs> know you already, either through the podcast or through your great YouTube channel, Author Level Up, or possibly from your many books for authors, or your co-hosting duties on the Ask Ally Member Q&A podcast. So if anyone wants to know more about Michael, they can just go to the indieauthor.com forward slash podcast and search for his name, and you'll find all sorts of fun info about Michael there. And Michael and I are doing kind of a, a periodic series on perspectives on, two perspectives on. We've already talked about making the most of in-person events, and we had a three perspectives on when Jennifer Hilt joined us to talk about year-end for the writing craft and the publishing voyage. And today we're going to be talking about two perspectives on author tools. And the one that I actually talked with Michael about was wide or deep, using tools wide or deep. But I realized as I was looking over my notes right before this, that I think another perspective we can bring is buy or build. And uh, yes. I think that maybe we're going to bring <laughs> different perspectives to this. So okay. the goal of the conversation is not to do an in-depth analysis of all the tools we use in our writing and publishing careers, but to focus on the strategies, the thought that we're putting into what tools we choose and what tools we don't choose so people can apply those to their own situations. Although I'm sure that in the process of the conversation, we're going to be sharing some recommendations. I also wanted to add that for the most part, I'm only discussing tools that I use for my writing craft and publishing voyage, not for example, for my podcast. So this will okay. be very much author, not podcasting centric. So I wanted to just start right out talking about our strategies for deciding which tools we use. And Michael, do you want to launch into that? What are your considerations when you're deciding whether to acquire a tool for your writing and publishing work? Yeah, I have three considerations. The first is, does it help me do something more efficiently? The second is kind of similar to it, but does it help me do something faster? And then the third is, does it improve my enjoyment? of whatever it is that I'm doing. So those are my three criteria. So it's speed, efficiency, and enjoyment. And if it meets at least one of those things, awesome, because then it's going to lead to either more words or more income, which is a good thing. If it meets two of them, it's amazing. If it meets all three of them, then it's a slam dunk. That's my criteria. And how are you distinguishing efficiency versus speed? If speed to me is how quickly... You do something, I mean, that's kind of the obvious definition. Efficiency is, to me, how well you do it. So oh, okay. efficiency sometimes can include speed, but it's also about how well you're doing it. So, for example, I dictate my novels. The problem with dictation is that if you use Dragon, it's really accurate. But when it's not accurate, it produces some really funky stuff. <laughs> and it's super weird. So I've developed some Microsoft Word macros that basically help me catch a lot of those funky errors. So it's a situation where it actually, I had to develop some word macros. And when I dictate and I upload my text into Word, I run this macro and it cleans up the text. So it doesn't necessarily increase my speed. It actually slows my speed down a little bit, but it well, actually doesn't. It increases my speed because it catches errors quickly, but it also makes the process of dictation more efficient. If okay. that makes sense. It's not just important to do something quickly. You also need to figure out how the tool can help you do it better. Yeah. And enjoyment almost what springs to mind for me is on the writing craft side. But do you find that same criteria applies when you're thinking about your publishing work? Yeah. I mean, there's just some stuff that's kind of a pain as an author. I mean, we want to spend time writing our books, but there's just so many other things to get in the way right? I mean, there's things we have to do with marketing, there's the publishing side. And so some of those things, I would imagine a lot of people are probably listening are not enjoyable. One of those things is calculating sales reports. So are there tools that you can use to calculate your sales reports with automation so that you don't have to tally them up <laughs> by hand, which is what I used to have to do 10 years ago. So increasing your enjoyment of the process, I think is also important because then it makes you more likely to do it. And if you can also spend less time doing it and do it more efficiently, then I think that's a win. And I'll talk about my one criteria that I apply, but as you're talking, of course, the things that you're saying make total sense to me, but I generally think about my tool usage as deep versus wide. 
So my goal is always to have as few as possible and the benefit there being lower cost and lower learning curve, and then use them Mm -hmm. to their utmost and only go to a new tool when I've exhausted what I can do with with the tools I have. So a good example, and I think this will be the only podcasting related example I'll use, but it's a really good one. So I want to use it is that I've used Descript for many years for my audio and video editing for the podcast, and it's been fine. But I recently started doing professional videos more on a freelance basis. And I did one and I just realized that I could probably do it with Descript, but if that's not really what it's built for, and I ended up just getting Camtasia because they finally just tipped me over. There was that like one more thing that I needed to do that I was really struggling with. And I finally thought, okay, I'm going to add Camtasia to my suite of applications because I've done everything I can with Descript without having it be a sufficient, less fast and less enjoyable (laughs) than if I just invest in a new tool. So that's kind of my primary area is deep versus wide. Do you have a position on the deep versus wide consideration? Yeah, I like your philosophy. It's really clear and it makes sense. And it's definitely one way to approach it. I am more of a wide versus deep guy because to me, I think you can always learn how to go deep quickly if you need to. My philosophy has always been, I want to make sure that I always have the right tool for any kind of situation that comes up. So I'm a very technical guy. So sometimes I find myself getting into stuff that's like, oh crap, what am I doing? (laughs) And so because of my personality type, I find that I just have to use more tools more frequently. So I was like, oh, that tool would be great for whenever I need to do this or that. And so I grab it. And it sets on my computer and then maybe one day I need it and I'll be glad I had it. Yes, I do have a lot of tools. No, I don't use them all on a regular basis. But when I come into situations where I come into for something sticky and it's like, oh crap, I need to be able to figure out how to do that. I have the right tool and I know where to go. And then if I don't know how to use it, I can go find a YouTube tutorial or And most places have forums, apps, tools have forums where you can go and figure out a specific use case and you can usually do it pretty quickly. So I think our philosophies are exactly the opposite. Yeah. (laughs) Which is fun, you know? Yeah, it is fun. And I think that my philosophy probably changed a little bit when I didn't have a corporate salary anymore. Because when I was working with my assistant to look at an analysis of my expenditures, and we'll be talking about how I did that a little later on, and my technical subscriptions, even with the strategy of having as few tools as I can possibly get away with, was a big chunk of my expenditures as part of my author career. And so like I got Camtasia for the license was $280 or something like that. So I thought much more deeply about it. Now that it's part of my PNL than before when I was my corporate job and I was like, oh, I'll just I'll skip a couple of dinners out or something like that. But then I realized the other thing is that I'm not a jump in and just kind of muck around kind of person. So when I got Camtasia, the first thing I did was go and watch all the Camtasia online videos. And so it's also like I have it on my mind that it's going to be an, a time investment that a person who goes in and mucks around, they may end up spending the same amount of time over time, but they don't factor it in like a separate consideration. But I set aside like a day to watch all the Camtasia educational videos. So it's just how you're weighing the costs and benefits of adding another tool to your toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you said two really good things there. The first is the cost of tools. Just because you have a lot of tools, that doesn't mean it has to be expensive. So for example, I don't really have that many subscriptions. I mean, I have a few things that I pay for, like I've got the Adobe Creative Cloud and there's a few other subscriptions that are kind of important for tools that I do use, but you don't have to have a subscription. I mean, there there are lots of apps that allow you to pay one time and you're done. So it's a one-time investment. And a lot of apps that I've paid for have paid for themselves with that one-term thing. So I mean, yes, you're correct. If you buy every tool that has a subscription, you'll go bankrupt really quickly. But I really don't spend that much on tools. I I buy what I need when I need it. And then the investment usually pays for itself at some point. Uh, The other thing that you said that I think was really insightful was you were talking about like documentation and reading and watching videos and all of that. I think that's really important, especially when you buy a tool for the first time. So it doesn't take very much time to kind of review the videos and the materials, or at least a quick walkthrough. And what I have found, and it's 
maybe a bit of a counterpoint to what you said, but what I found is that when you go to a, a program when you need it, your learning tends to be deeper because you have more of a practical application of it. So that's just something I've learned over the years. I mean, once you've used enough tools, you find that they're similar enough that you can kind of use them. Like I bet if I jumped into Camtasia, I've used enough video editing software that I could probably figure it out pretty quick. So there's that too. The more tools you use, the better you are at using tools. So that's just a something to think about. Yeah. And I think that the cost that I have for my subscription type things, and I'm thinking of like Descript as a subscription, Zoom, Libsyn. Again, I'm venturing a bit into some of the The podcast podcast related things. But last year, yeah, in 2022, it seemed like they all offered the discount if you got a year. And so my recognition of what I was spending was sort of exaggerated because all at once, instead of paying $10 a month for 12 months, I was paying $90 all at once. And so I was saving money in the long term, but it was this more like attention getting expenditure because it was that. And it seemed like last year they all did that. So I had this one big chunk of outlay in order to accommodate that. And then the other aspect that we're talking about is buy versus build. And I don't know if it makes sense to talk about this a little bit theoretically first or to talk about in the context of the tools we're using. Anything you'd like to say about buy versus build before we start through our review of our tools? Yeah, yeah. This one is really important. And it's one that I think a lot of people don't have an appetite for. But if you develop the skill, it's invaluable. I mean, to me, this one thing has made me lots of profit and it has improved my processes and efficiencies an unbelievable number of times. So when you think about buying a tool, you're buying a tool that somebody else has already developed that makes it easier for you to do and it's convenient, right? So it's like, if you need something, you just go get it. It's like preparing your own food versus going to a restaurant. When you're really hungry, you're going to go get fast food or go get takeout because somebody's already going to do it. The most work you have to do is put your credit card in, take the food, (laughs) put it in your car, go home and eat it, right? Yep. But if you want to prepare your own food, you've got to go to the grocery store. You've got to get the ingredients together. You got to know how to put them together. And then you get what is probably, I think we can agree, a better meal, but it takes you more time. It depends on whether you're going for fast food or you're going for the nice restaurant. This is true. This is true. But, you know, we'll assume a nice casual meal. (laughs) You're going to get a something that maybe you could have made at home, right? So when you buy a tool, it's the equivalent of going to a restaurant and there's nothing wrong with that. When you prepare a tool, it's the equivalent of staying at home and cooking your own food, which there's also nothing wrong with that. So I think it depends on the situation. So most people listening to this are not technical at all, don't know how to program, and would be better staying out of the kitchen, right? (laughs) Unless you have that skill to do it. Now, there's a middle ground here, and that is you can hire somebody to build something for you. So you can hire a programmer to build you an application that can do something that maybe you can't get somewhere else, or maybe you have an application that's really expensive. Now, most things you shouldn't buy applications for, but there are things that can help you improve your workflows and your processes that can help you. Like for example, OpenAI just released a new audio model. It's called Whisper and it transcribes audio and it works just like Dragon and it's free. So I hired a developer to build an application that uses Whisper where I can upload my audio to it, get it back, and then I don't have to rely on Dragon, right? So if one day Dragon goes the way of the Dodo, which it could because Microsoft is rumored to be doing some things with it, then I still have a tool that I can use. So kind of it's similar to that, but build versus buy. I'm a big fan of building something when it doesn't exist already and it'll help you improve your processes. I'm not so much a fan of building something that already exists that you can probably buy and get a better customer. Well, I really like the restaurant analogy and I think it it plays out really nicely because there is the 
making your meatloaf at home versus taking cutting meatloaf from takeout or whatever, then I think that the analogy of, or you go to a fine restaurant and you order the three or four courses is also has an interesting tools analogy because there are these things that are so complex. Like I'm never going to want to cook a four course meal in my own kitchen. And in the same way that I'm never going to want to try to cobble together all the things that Descript does in terms of automated AI exactly. and sound leveling and all those things. So I'm totally willing to pay the the fine dining tab in order to have somebody do that. But as kind of an entree to our discussion, I decided we would use, because we're both big Ally fans, we're going to use the Ally six of the seven processes of publishing to talk through our use of tools. And we're going to start out with Number one, which is editorial, and I'm going to roll into that number zero, which is writing. And this is the rare example of me building rather than buying, because I use Excel for plotting. So listeners have listened, heard many times me talk about this big spreadsheet that I use where it's characters across the top and chapters down the side. And in each cell, I put what does a character think, know, believe, and feel at a certain point? And that way I can look down the column and see the whole storyline for that character. I can look across a row and see everything that's happening in the story to all the characters at that point. And that is very similar. Like if I just described that and didn't tell you what I was using, then people might well think, oh, she must be using Plotter. And in fact, I have Plotter for two reasons. One is that it's such a common tool. And in the interest of building out my consulting practice, I thought it was would be good for me to be familiar with Plotter, even if I wasn't using it myself to be familiar with it. And I always like to see how people, what people are doing in built tools like that, that I might be able to duplicate in Excel because I'm a big Excel nerd. And if I can sort, filter things and apply conditional formatting, there's really nothing I can't do that I need to do in order to plot a book. So there is one where Plotter is a fabulous tool. I would definitely recommend it to people who didn't want to muck around in Excel, but Excel is really doing what I need it to do from a plotting point of view. Any yeah. thoughts about the tools you apply to your writing and editorial work? Yeah, Plotter is great. I actually just did a video review of Plotter. It kind of gives you the best of Excel without it being Excel, <laughs> which is yeah. nice because you can kind of filter everything. But yeah, I guess the tools that I use in my writing process have changed over the years. I used to be a Scrivener guy. So, and I still love Scrivener. I have switched over to Microsoft Word just because there's so much more I can do with it now than I think I could do 10 years ago. For editing, I use Grammarly Premium. I'm not the biggest fan of the user interface, but it does catch typos and things like that I think are critical. Um, I also use a tool called Perfect It, which is like a proofreading app. And I think it's great. A lot of people feel like it's an uphill battle to try to get writers to use Perfect It <laughs> because it, it uses the Chicago manual style and it, it kind of helps you get your manuscript in accordance with that, which is great. And then I use Microsoft Word macros, as I mentioned, that's kind of a very specific use case. And that's really it. For me, I am building some applications to use like GPT-3 and chat GPT and the soon to come GPT-4 to help me with editing because AI is actually a very capable proofreader. It can catch a lot of typos and things that Grammarly cannot catch. So that's a tool that I'm kind of looking into right now, but I try to keep it simple when it comes to the actual writing process. Well, that highlights another distinction, which is early adopter or not. So yeah, true. I use Scrivener. I write in Scrivener. And then to do a lot of stuff with it, I have to export it or then export it to other things that we'll talk about under the design category. But mm -hmm. I've looked at Atticus a little bit. And I believe that one of the goals of Atticus is to eliminate this need to, I'm writing in Scrivener and now I'm exporting it to Word to give it to my editor. Now I'm incorporating exactly. the words the changes back into Scrivener. Now I'm exporting it to Word again in order to get it developed, format it, like that kind of silliness. And it sounds like a great goal. I mean, when they get to that point where they're really doing all those functions, as you can only do when you've been an application out there for a little while, then yeah. I would definitely consider moving over to Atticus. But I was not interested in being an early adopter of Atticus because I wanted somebody else to work out all the bugs <laughs> before I started using yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think Atticus is the future. It's one of the main reasons I switched to Word because I just got tired of 
doing the volleyball between Scrivener and Word because it has to go to your editor and then it goes to Scrivener and then it goes into Vellum. I'm just not, I wasn't interested in that. So that's why I adopted Microsoft Word. So I could just do everything in one app. I think that's kind of the important thing. But yeah, I think early adoption, there's a time and a place for it. Like you said, you don't necessarily want to be the person that is beta testing an app, especially when you're aiming to be a professional writer. It's when you've got a full day, you've got lots of books to write, lots of projects you're working on. I just don't have the time to give to somebody to help them beta test. But when it comes to something like, you know, artificial intelligence or new technology, where maybe it can help you if you're willing to spend a little bit of time and money to develop something and it gives you an advantage, then that is, I think, the time to think about early adoption. Yeah, and this is highlighting yet another consideration, which is, are you working with someone on something? And you and I know all about this. Yeah, We've been yes. co-working on some materials and we've, I think, really struggled with how to do that most efficiently. So we were sort of brain dumping material into Google Docs, which is convenient because two people can mm-hmm. be working at it at one time, but it is truly a horrible it experience from an, a writing and editing point of view. And I don't know what it is about the UI, but it's just like, I struggle to be creative when I'm working in Google Docs. And then we kind of I got agree. to a point where we could move it to Word and that has some benefits. And then it has some downsides. You put a hard no to Scrivener, which I can understand. I'm co-authoring yeah. a piece of fiction with another author and she and I are both Scrivener users, but Scrivener doesn't lend itself to share documentation. So then we right. were working in Word. Then we moved. It's, it's kind of a mess. And I don't think there's a good tool out there that really makes that co-authoring as easy as it could be. Maybe Atticus will be that tool. Yeah. Yeah. That it doesn't exist right now. And we'll see kind of where it goes. And I think that that's the, another thing that is is what's so important about this for me is that the biggest pain points that writers can have is in this process. Like if most people don't really think about what we just talked about, the fact that you have to shuffle your manuscript between applications, because I think people just kind of accept that's just how it is. Yeah. But if you look at it from an efficiency perspective, I'm an efficiency guy. Like I have to do things that make sense and that are efficient because efficiency increases everything else in your business, right? Increases your sales, increases your speed, increases your volume, increases your output, everything. And if you look at the process that people follow, it's just not efficient. People are wasting time and money and effort with a process like this, where you're trading manuscripts back and forth. And so I think it's up to each individual person to figure out how to make their processes more efficient, because I don't think that there's going to be a developer that's going to come in and save the day and do it for us. Because I think if somebody could have solved this problem, they would have solved it already. But yeah, like I said, I think apps like Atticus are the future. And I think there's a value to having everything done in one place. And I think that value just hasn't been realized yet. I don't think people realize, oh, yeah, wait, I'm not, I shouldn't be doing this with Scrivener. This is a waste of time. <laughs> I'm yeah, not going to do it, it anymore. It's you know? like the canonical story about the person who cut the turkey and have to put it in the oven because that's what her mom did. And that's what yep. her grandmother did. And her grandmother had only done it because the oven she had 75 years ago wouldn't fit the whole turkey. But yeah, we do those things without really thinking through it. And that's when building, I mean, I think this would be unrealistic to build a tool that you could then easily use for co-authoring or something like that. But it is an attraction of building. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's, but you know, it is what it is. Like I said, we're not a technical group of people and it doesn't make sense to build an application that does all that stuff. Yeah. So that's what I mean. I think it's important to think about also using the tools that are already on your computer to help you be efficient. Like Automator on Macs, that's a wonderful tool that can help you save a lot of time. There's a lot of things it can do. Macros for Excel, macros for Word, Windows PowerShell. I mean, you don't have to know how to use these things, but if you can watch some videos on YouTube, you can hire somebody on a place like Fiverr. And I think you'd be shocked at how little they charge to develop something that can help you solve whatever issue you're trying to solve. That's how I've built a lot of my processes and been more efficient. Yeah. Well, let's keep marching through the processes of publishing. The next one is going to be design. So I would say that for design, and by this, we mean the design of the interior and the exterior of the book, 
I use Vellum for formatting. So Scrivener to Word to Vellum, and then you generate the eBooks and the print interior. Do you use a different tool for that? No, that's basically what I use. I use I use Vellum, but then I also use Caliber. And I use Caliber to do like some just checking up on the formatting just to make sure everything looks okay. And then there's a tool that I use for accessibility. It's one that I think people should look into. It's called Ace Plus by Daisy. And that will scan your ebook to determine if it is accessible to the blind, right? So when the blind read books, they have to use screen readers. And so sometimes if you do some wonky things with formatting in your book, it just makes it much more difficult for them to read. So I do that as an additional step just to make sure that my books are accessible as well. But yeah, those are the processes that I use. And Ace Plus is free, by the way. Okay. Yeah. See, we went in with just wide versus steep, but every time we have a conversation, I'm thinking of another consideration in this yeah. um, in this decision tree of tool usage. And that is to what extent do you want to customize? Because I love Vellum because as I think Vellum themselves would say, they have pretty much one role in life and it is to make beautiful books easily. And, and they're good at it. And they're very good at it. And it is almost like you get your file in there. You have to do a little bit of fussing around with like letting it know that something is a, an acknowledgement. Although oftentimes it already knows it's an acknowledgement. And then you pretty much press a button and you get lovely, lovely books. And with the design, designed by actual design professionals. And so I've been very happy with that. I like the fact that there are a relatively limited number of choices. I've picked one template for my fiction. I've picked one template for my nonfiction. I know all my fiction books are going to look consistent because of the template. All my nonfiction books will look consistent because of the template. But I think that if somebody really wanted to be futzing around and say, oh, I want the large initial cap to be smaller or something, then that's a level of customization that I'm not interested in. So the fact that Vellum does this one thing, but doesn't, I think it's successful because it doesn't let you go too far afield <laughs> where writers, not designers. And sometimes people make bad decisions about their design when they start mucking around in the details like that. So I wasn't interested in doing that. And Vellum keeps you from doing that. But if you're really looking for heavy customization, then Vellum is probably not the tool you're using anyway. Well, Vellum... I think is the clearest example of something that improves your speed, efficiency, and enjoyment. Yeah. So yeah. But before Vellum, you had to either use Scrivener to format your books, which is just an exercise in frustration. I was able to figure it out, but it took forever. Yeah. Vellum makes the process of formatting a book easier. It makes it faster and more efficient because you're going to get a better looking product than if you did it in Scrivener or if you did it in Word. There are lots of Word templates that were floating around on how to format your books, which varying levels of quality. And I just enjoy the process more because I don't have to spend as much time in it. Yeah. <laughs> and that is why Vellum is successful. That to me is the clearest example of that. But yeah, that's, yeah, customizing, you, you definitely don't want to go too far off the beaten path. And I think Vellum has always done everything I needed it to do. Some of the diagnostic tools that I use have just helped me kind of refine some of the issues that I had. For example, like you have to, to make your books more accessible, you have to make sure you have alt tags and image descriptions on all your images. Well, maybe if you miss one or two of those, you, oh, you can go back into Vellum, fix it, and then re-export it, right? Yeah. So being able to use your Vellum file, is that's really critical. And I, I don't really recommend people go off the beaten path and try to customize that. Yeah. Any comments you would like to make about the exterior design, the tools you use for that? I, I guess for my design, I'm in this awkward in-between phase. I am still hiring cover designers, but I am learning how to do my own covers. And I'm learning how to do my own covers for some of my simpler nonfiction, maybe short story collections. And then I'm waiting to see how AI art pans out to see if I can start doing my own covers for my fiction with AI art. And, you know, so I use Photoshop. I took a course and tried to learn how to use it. Photoshop is like having a Ferrari. I mean, you have the, all this horsepower and you don't necessarily need it all. So that if there's any tool I think I've struggled with the most, it's probably Photoshop just because there's so much to learn. But that's kind of what I use. Canva is a great tool if you want to spend the time, effort to, learn how to use it. And it's really easy to use as well. But yeah. yeah, I'm more of a Photoshop guy when it comes to this, because there's just more, 
like in my genres, there's just more stuff you have to be able to do on the cover that Canva just can't do for you. Yeah. Well, I do want to talk a little bit more about AI because that's something I'm currently using more for marketing. Although when I was thinking of actually doing a full recover, I was using mid journey to generate images that I was then planning on giving to my cover designer to say, I kind of want something like this because the mid journey generated images was a little bit too fantasy-ish looking or something like that. And I couldn't quite pull the levers on mid journey to not get that kind of effect. But yeah, that's a fun tool. And we'll talk about that a little bit more under the marketing and promotion area. Um, distribution. I was struggling to know how to categorize tools related to distribution. I, I would say the big one that I have used is books to read. So oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's, one. Yeah. it's a, just an easy way to kind of bundle all your links together. I've also used genius link. That's a service that I recommend that, that localizes your Amazon links, which is really helpful when you're giving them out on social media or your website, that sort of thing. Bitly actually talking about books yeah, to read Bitly, makes me so, think of Bitly. Yeah, very similar to Bitly, but way more high powered, right? You can, I mean, you can do a lot more with it, but yeah, those are the big vision tools that I use. I think that it's worth thinking about how you present your book on your website as well. So usually most people have a page on your site that's ded dedicated to each book. So it's also, I think, worth thinking about how you structure that page and what kind of tools or plugins you use on that page to make it easier for people to buy your books. So for example, being able to put the logos of your different retailers on your book page so people know, oh, your book is available on Barnes & Noble. It's available on Kobo or Apple or Google Play. And then having tools that allow them to buy easily and being able to get the right book to the right reader at the right time, I think is also important. So it's not so much a distribution tool, it's more of just a way to think about it. Because to me, the first place people are going to go is on your website. So you have to be able to funnel them out to places where you can buy. And I think that comes to having a good strategy for your book pages. It's also making me think that I should be counting PayHip as a tool in my distribution strategy. So I have my direct sales store. Yeah, on absolutely. Direct PayHip. sales is a great example. Yeah. When, I, when Shopify was all the rage, I looked into that a little bit. And among other reasons, I didn't go there because there is a, a fee for using that. Whereas you're paying for the privilege of using PayHip by them keeping a little cut of the sale. It's a very small cut of the right. sale. So yeah, PayHip would be another distribution tool that I'm using. And book funnel, and book funnel, yeah, yeah, book funnel and uh, authors direct, where you can deliver audiobooks to readers as well. I think direct sales is a great example of that. And book funnel is one of those that, whenever the renewal fee comes up, I always think, oh, I'm only using like a tiny fraction of book funnel functionality, but it's it's so easy and it's so ubiquitous that I always yeah. re up because I think another consideration is tools that the people that you're going to be working with are familiar with or not. Mm -hmm. And so again, I'm straying a little far afield from a strictly author related example, but Zoom, I mean, there are other tools I could use other than Zoom, but everybody knows Zoom. And if I send a Zoom link to a podcast guest, they recognize it. They're not freaked out by it. Chances are quite good. They've used Zoom and they know what buttons to press and things like that. Whereas sometimes I have the feeling if I went with another provider, there would be this extra level of, oh my God, I've never used this before. And so yeah. book funnel is kind of like that. Like I think readers get used to seeing that. They recognize that they trust the content from book funnel. So the the reputation and the commonality of a tool can be a consideration. Well, it comes back down to speed, efficiency, and enjoyment. Yeah. If you don't use book tool, the alternative is really painful. So yeah. before book funnel came along, I used to have to actually help readers troubleshoot how to get books onto their devices. And it sucked. I hated yeah. it. It was one of the worst. It's I don't ever want to go back to those days. <laughs> <laughs> so that is an example of a tool where it's really helpful to have. Yep. And that's the kind of thing that every once in a while I'll venture into some of the other offerings that BookFunnel has. Like I'll check out the newsletter swaps. I send newsletters out to my fiction platform. I've pretty much committed to them that I only email them when I have an author event or book launch. So I don't feel like I can really step up and be a full participant in newsletter swaps, but right. it's good every once in a while 
just to go in there and check things out and say, oh, you know what, this is actually different than I thought, or, oh, my business has changed. So now this does make sense for me. So it, even if you have a tool where you're not using it to its fullest, just every once in a while, take a quick tour through the things you're not using to see if you can't start using them. So let's move on to marketing. And there's marketing and promotion. And I'm going to give the ally explanation, which is marketing is the ongoing work that you do in order to keep yourself front and center with your readers to support their interactions. And then promotion is different in the sense that it's those time specific things like I have a book bug feature deal or I'm running a, an ad or something like that. So when we're thinking about marketing, I categorized Weebly, which is what I do my web page in and Aweber, which is my email service. And so I would say that the pro of Weebly, it's one of those ones that when I started my website 10 years ago, it showed up more frequently as a recommended one. Now I think you hear more about Wix. I tried WordPress and I got very frustrated with WordPress and I just never felt comfortable with it. I had made an ill-advised switch from Weebly to WordPress and back to Weebly for my indie author website, which was a terrible, terrible waste of time and money. So let's talk first about websites. Any thoughts on the tools you're picking for your website presence? Yeah, I use WordPress and I, I'm not the biggest fan of WordPress, but it's the best or I shouldn't say the best, but it's the biggest game in town, I guess. Everybody knows that it's easier to get support for it if you have issues, that sort of thing. WordPress plugins, I think are important. You kind of have to be careful with WordPress plugins though, because if you have too many, then your site just gets kind of crazy and it gets hard to maintain, but having the right plugins, I think is important. So one that I use is pretty links and that allows me to give out nice and clean links to pages on my site. So like if I have an affiliate link, like if I'm promoting Scrivener, for example, instead of sending them to literature and slash Scrivener slash Mac OS or whatever the link is to, I send them to author level slash Scrivener. And then I can send them wherever I want. So for example, if the page on this Scrivener page changes, I can just simply change it at the source with the Pretty Links app or the Pretty Links plugin. And then I don't have to worry about changing any of my links that I've ever given out previously. So you give out one link and then you can change where it goes at any time, which I think is the longer I'm around and the more links I give out, the more valuable that is for me. Yeah. Because... I cannot tell you how many times over the years I've given out links and then they end up being broken. Yeah. And that's really bad when you're giving out affiliate links, for example. So pretty links is kind of a, an important one for me, a good contact form. I know it sounds weird to talk about contact form with marketing, but I have found that readers reach out to me on a regular basis. And so having a contact form that makes sure that I get the responses quickly is important because that's good marketing. Being able to talk to your readers and reply to their emails quickly is really important to me. So those are on the, off the top of my head, the two biggest ones, other than just having a good book page layout that kind of makes it easier for them to find stuff. Yeah. What you're saying reminds me of a change that I made on my Weebly site that I was using a free plugin for comments and it did not include a notification of when a comment came in. <laughs> so when I was prepping every episode of the podcast, I would go back over the last, I don't know, five or six and look to see if any, anyone had posted any comments. And it was not only just a drag and very inefficient, but it also kind of sucked for people who posted a comment for an older episode and I would never see it. And so I finally decided in part because I was trying to drive traffic to my indie author YouTube channel. And I do get notifications when people post comments on my YouTube channel, I started sending people there. And while it was at first triggered by the fact that I wanted to get notifications and wanted to avoid this inefficient process, in the end, I think it was better because at the moment, I'm actually more interested in sending people to my YouTube channel than I am in sending them to my website. So it was sort of, it was a virtuous cycle because I got a benefit there by addressing another issue. But when you're looking for a function, you might be looking very specifically, oh, it's my web page, so I have to find a solution that's compatible with my web page, but sometimes you can step back and say, no, there's a whole host of other tools that I don't think of as being associated with my website that could help address that issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another tool that I've used on my website, this kind of goes into the buy slash build thing. 
I, on my fiction website, I have a tool, it's called Book Wizard. And my philosophy is I always want to make sure that I get the right book to the right reader at the right time. And I have a big portfolio of books. So it's easy for readers to come to my website and just be like, oh my God, this guy has too much. I don't know. I don't know where to start. If you have analysis paralysis, a lot of people just don't make a decision and they leave your website. So it's a, it's a simple tool. It, it just basically asks, what do you feel like reading today? And they click and then it, it basically recommends which book they should start with. I used some little rinky dinky WordPress plugin that, to do that. It's due for an update now because I have a lot more books, but that's the sort of thing where you can get creative and you can kind of figure out from a marketing perspective what it is that people want from your site. How do they engage with it? And you can figure out ways to either find an existing plugin or kind of jerry rig some way to, to help them do it. Yeah. The conversation is reminding me of yet another dimension of choosing tools and that's customer service. So I used MailChimp for a long time, and then I ended up switching to AWeber. And AWeber customer service is wonderful. And what you do, you know, you're working in AWeber and you have a question, you click the little chat button. Guess what? Seconds later, an actual person shows up and you can chat with them. Yeah. And don't tell this, but I would pay twice what I'm paying for AWeber for the customer service. And there are other tools that I use despite the terrible customer service, because I'm like, okay, well, the tool itself is exactly what I need. But every time I run into an issue, I just want to shoot myself because I know that the process of getting help is going to be so painful. So sometimes I think you end up paying a bit of a premium for excellent customer service, but it's something you should factor in because it can make the enjoyment a lot higher. Yeah. Well, it's like going to Ace Hardware versus Home Depot. So you, you go to Home Depot, they have more stuff, but you better know what you're looking for because you're never going to find anybody yeah. to help you. But yeah. if you go to Ace Hardware and they basically fall over themselves to try to help you with what you want, <laughs> but you're going to pay more for it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's kind of the same thing. But yeah, yeah. I use GetResponse for my email provider. And I like them for that exact reason that you gave is I can click a button 24 seven and somebody will respond. And they don't just respond. They actually take the time to help you. Yeah, And that's, to me, that's invaluable. And then also just the user interface of your email provider too is kind of important because if you're not in there that frequently, or if, even if you are in there frequently, it should be easy to use. And I've used quite a few over the years. I'm not going to name names, but they're not all easy to use. Some of yeah. them are laid out just horrendously. And, it, and I like get response because it's just, you literally click a few buttons and you type in what you want and you can send it out and make it easy. Yeah, well, I'm going to use that as an entree to the next category, which is promotion. And we already talked about Canva. I've used Canva for years, primarily as making ads, making social media posts and things like that. I've started adding mid-journey created AI images as backgrounds to my ads. So that's been fun. Another thing that I wish Canva did better than it did is that I use Bookbrush and I use Bookbrush pretty much only for those instant mockups where you upload your book cover and then you can create a bunch of images that look like, you know, a person holding your book on the beach or your book in a e-reader and things like that. I use those images on Payhip, for example. So this is one that should be easier. So I make a 3D image of my book on an e-reader in Bookbrush, and then I import it into Canva because if you take the Bookbrush generated image and put it in Payhip, Payhip distorts it because it's not a square image. So then I have to put it in Canva to create <laughs> a square image that I can then put on Payhip. It really makes me want to pull my hair out every time. But so I really like the Bookbrush instant mock ups. And I also use Bookbrush because it does a really nice job. If you want the Amazon A plus content where it's the three stacked images, you can create it as one image in Bookbrush and then it, Bookbrush automatically breaks it up for you. But there's something about like the philosophy behind the tool. And this is a video that I wish a lot more tools provided that I don't often find. And it's like, these are the three things you should know about how this application thinks in the background, because However, Bookbrush is organizing its work, it's not the way I think of it. And so I always struggle. Like I have so many extra projects because when I think I'm saving something, evidently Bookbrush thinks I'm duplicating it. It's, it's kind of a mess. So I keep it because there are a couple of things it does very well, but I 
use Canva for a lot of things that I think otherwise people would use Bookbrush for because Bookbrush mm -hmm. just kind of doesn't make intuitive sense to me. And I think that's yet another consideration. What's a tool that makes intuitive sense to you in terms of pulling the levers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're venturing into my side of the water, Maddie. You, you have the right tool for the right circumstance. So yeah. being able to create the mock-up. Yeah. yeah. I've used Bookbrush a few times and I do like it. I've used it for the things you talked about. And then I've also used it for just some general marketing like reels and stuff. And it's a good app and it does what it does really well. And I think that's the thing is you, there's some apps, like there's going to be book brush people and there's going to be Canva people. And I think it just depends on how your brain is wired, but intuitiveness in an app is really important. Yeah. Other applications that you'd like to mention related to promotion? Yeah. The biggest promotion thing I do is just is emails email newsletters. I guess the more important thing that I've used lately is copywriting. So copywriting tools. I built a tool in Excel to kind of help me make sure I don't miss the important things when I'm copywriting. So like when I'm writing a book description, when I'm writing a Facebook ad to make sure I've got the important stuff in there. And there's tools out there like, oh, there's all sorts of AI tools that can kind of help you with copy too. That is kind of nice. And that's maybe more on the marketing side, but yeah, those are helpful because sometimes those tools can write better copy than we can write. <laughs> they give us ideas and things. That yeah, or, that are, yeah, be a, a yeah. trigger. And I think that it would behoove everyone to hop on ChatGPT and MidJourney because they're now free or you can get free versions of them. And that may not always be true. So I would get in there and get an account just in case that provides some more runway for free usage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think Jasper is the tool that people use for like copywriting. There's a bunch of them and they're a dime a dozen. They're all kind of built on the same engines. But yeah, I mean, MidJourney definitely for the art is very helpful. I'm finding MidJourney can be useful to generate images for like your ads as well, yeah. like your Facebook ads and things. Because the problem I had with ads, like in particular, and to a lesser extent, BookBub, the problem I had is the best way to get images is to just go to like a stock photo site like Shutterstock or Deposit Photo or you go and just find like fantasy related images if you write fantasy. And that's the best way to do it. It's the most cost effective way. You don't spend a whole lot of time in BookBrush or Canva trying to figure out what your image is supposed to look like if that's not your thing. And often those images perform better than the images that you kind of cobble together. And what I have found is that it's not so easy to find fantasy related images on stock media sites. And so being able to generate something with mid journey is actually really helpful because th th the image itself really isn't important. It's just about getting people's attention. So if you can generate an image that gets people's attention, that's really like critical. And then another reason I use mid journey, it's not for ads, but you know, I have people of color in my books. I mean, my main characters are often people of color. And if you go to like a Shutterstock or a deposit photo, you don't really get very many models that have people of color. And if you do, everybody else is using that same person. Yeah. So being able to create somebody who doesn't technically exist with a tool like mid journey or stable diffusion is, is a really, I think, important step to being able to put people on your covers that you want to be able to put on your covers. It's my number one struggle with book covers is being able to find a model that has the skin tone that is in the book. Yeah, I think regarding images, I've gotten deposit photo. It seems like every year there's a big AppSumo discount on deposit photo and I've gotten it two years and now I have more credits yep. than I'm ever going to use. I think a lot of people are in that same boat. Yes. But they're also, don't forget that a lot of the tools like Canva have built in stock images. And of course, people need to consider things like, is everybody else using those? But it can provide a nice background for an ad or something like that. One of those things mm -hmm. that it's worth taking a tour through the parts of the app that you're not using actively. And you might find out, oh, I, I don't really need to buy another year's worth of deposit photo credits because there's a pool of a images here I can use. Yeah. So I'm going to switch over to administration. And these are the things that did, don't easily fit into the other categories. And again, it, I don't want to get into a detailed description of each of these, but I use scribe count. So early on, we were talking about the time that one can spend collecting sales data. And it's not only time consuming, but also very error prone. So I was a happy, happy camper when scribe count came along and collected all that data for me. Any tool you want to mention in terms of collecting sales data? 
Yeah, this is one area where I went way off the beaten path and I built my own tool. And the reason I did that is because I, I don't want to give anybody my sales data. And it's nothing against any of the companies out there that are doing it. I just prefer to keep that local and private on my computer. So I chained together a bunch of Microsoft Excel macros. I have an access database that allows me to do that. And I paid a, a programmer a couple hundred bucks to develop that for me. So all I have to do is feed my sales reports into the machine. The machine spits out how much I made, and then I can do pivot tables and run reports on my sales. And I've got all my sales going all the way back to when I first started. So I can filter it with any category, any criteria that I want. If I want to know how much one of my particular books sold in Germany in ebook in 2015, I can get that in seconds. So, you know, that's an unusual use case. I think scribe count is probably the right tool for most people, but yeah, sales. I mean, most people just don't even mess with their sales. <laughs> like they just will take yeah. their tax reports they get at the end of the year and they can give that to their accountant and they're good. But being able to know your sales data and being able to go through it and comb through it and ask questions of it and get answers back is really important because it uncovers opportunities. Because maybe one of your books is taking off in an another country and you maybe you wouldn't have known that. So oh, maybe you need to start running ads in Australia for one of your books. Right. Yeah. But you would never know that unless you have ready access to your sales data. Exactly. But not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And ScribeCount is actually another good example where I ended up saving some money because Trello is what I use to manage my to-do list. And I've used a free version of Trello for years and years. And it does 99% of the things I'd like it to do. And the remaining 1% doesn't really matter that much to me until I started being much more active about running promotions. And I needed some way that my assistant and I could keep track of what promotions were running, which ones were coming up. We wouldn't want to have too many overlapping promotions at one time. And the only way to do that in Trello would have required that I got a uh, paid account. But then I discovered that ScribeCount has a promotion calendar feature. And so for the price of my scribe count subscription, which I was getting anyway, I also had this additional functionality of the calendar. So it prevented me from having yeah. to get the paid version of Trello. So you know, do you have a tool that you're using for keeping track of your task list? Oh Excel. yeah, I've used, I've, well, no, I don't no. use, oh God, no, I <laughs> don't use Excel for that. Oh no? Um, no, no. I'm one of those people that's always constantly changing my furniture when it comes to this sort of thing. So I used to use, I think I used Asana at one point. I used pretty much every to-do you can think of I have used. What I have settled on now is thinking about it more holistically. So I actually, it's better for me to have an ecosystem. So it's not just about the to-do. It's about how I'm handling email, how I'm handling my calendars, and then how I'm handling my to-do. So what I have settled on lately, and it has actually been probably the best thing that I've done is I use Apple Mail. I used to use lots of fancy email providers. I don't anymore. I use Apple Mail. I use Apple Reminders and I use Apple Notes. And that is my to-do system. So when an email comes in, because I don't know about you, Maddie, but I feel like email drives my life. <laughs> so any to-dos that I have are often coming out of email. So when I have a to-do that comes in, I basically save that email into Apple Reminders and it's got a feature basically where you can save the email and attach a reminder to it. And then I organize my to-dos in Apple Reminders. And Apple Reminders is not like amazing compared to a lot of other to-do things out there. But I think it's just, it's helpful for me to have an ecosystem that works and communicates neatly together. That helps me stay organized. Yeah. It's yet another consideration, which is where do you want to be spending your time? Like I'm always finding ways to detach myself from my email. And so yeah. I'm always going into Trello reviewing what is in my to-do list, but I wouldn't want to go into an email system to do that. So it's where do you want to be? Where exactly. do you want to be living electronically is another consideration. And I think another consideration like with co-authoring is shareability. So in 2022, I got an assistant. We both feel comfortable with Trello. So we found Trello to be a really efficient way of sharing our to-do lists. And I'll use that as an entree to the last thing I have on my list for administration, which is QuickBooks. So I had chosen mm -hmm. QuickBooks because 
everybody who's in the financial world knows QuickBooks. And so it was easy for me to find people to help me get my account set up because it's such a common app. My assistant was interested in learning more about QuickBooks, so it worked well there. So it's sort of like Zoom. QuickBooks is everywhere. So if you need help or if you either are looking for help like an online tutorial or you're looking for help like hiring someone to help you with it, then picking an application that is commonly used, I think is a good idea. Thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, QuickBooks, any kind of tax software to help you do that, I think is absolutely important. I think maybe the last administration thing on my list would be, and I mentioned this before, but like Automator and apps on your computer that kind of chain processes together, just make things really easy. So like when I was going to go on this podcast with you, I have a few things that I have to do. So there's a light on my desk. I have to turn that on. I have to turn on a couple of different applications for my microphone, a couple of different applications for my webcam because I use a DSLR as a webcam and then Zoom. So I have all of that chained into a like I have a Stream Deck. If you've never seen that, it's like a it's like a little pad that sits on your desk and it's got these little nice gel buttons and when you press one of the buttons something happens and you can program commands onto your Stream Deck. Cool. So I have every everything chained so that I press one button, the light comes on, all the applications come on, Zoom comes up, and all I have to do is go to the meeting. That's so cool. So like stuff like that, just little things or or like Automator, I have when I dictate my audio, I do it on a voice recorder. So I, I connect my voice recorder to the computer. Well, normally what I would have to do is I'd have to open up the voice recorder file system or whatever, get the audio, put it on my computer, then go to Dragon and then transcribe it and then take the transcripted text, put it into Microsoft Word and then start editing it. So what I do now is I developed a little automator process where the moment my voice recorder connects to the computer, the system grabs the audio, puts it into a folder, Dragon automatically starts transcribing it. And then I just have to wait for the text to appear. So It's little stuff like that. It sounds kind of insignificant, but it adds up in a big way over the course of your career. Simple things like setting email rules. So like I said, that email drives my life. It does, but I usually have zero emails in my inbox at any time. And that is because I usually have rules. So if like, for example, it comes from a certain person, it gets flagged as a star so that I, that's a higher priority. Or emails that people, when people are out of the office and they send send vacation autoresponders, those, I have email rules where those automatically go to the trash so that I'm spending as little time in my email inbox as possible. Stuff like that. I mean, just if you can find all those little pain points and you can find ways using tools that are already on your computer to solve them, it just makes you so much more effective. And it's just something that a lot of people don't think about and people will very quickly go and pay for tools that are already built into their computer. It's just one of my hobby horses that I, one of my soapboxes that I like to get on. (laughs) There's this movie, it's called Defending Your Life by Albert Brooks. Have you ever seen it? No. There's a scene in the movie where basically the guy dies and goes to like purgatory and that's like the afterlife. And he's talking to this guy there and he's like, yeah, everyone here uses more than 10% of their brains. You don't want to use 10% of your brain. If you use 10% of your brain, you should be on earth. You should be on earth and stuck being a human. It's kind of like that. I mean, most people probably only use five to 10% of their computer, computer's yeah. power. And if you could use more of that, it doesn't cost you any more money or any more time or money. I mean, you might have to help pay somebody to help you with it, but it makes you more efficient. And it's, it, I think it's a good thing, but that's just me personally. Yeah, well, I think that is a great wrap up thought that probably for many of us, our computer is the key tool that we use in our writing and publishing lives, among other things. And the assignment is everybody should go just take a tour through the apps that are already on their computer, the built in apps on the computer and see how they might be able to deploy them in some of the ways that you've suggested to increase their efficiency, their speed and and your enjoyment. And your phones. Yes, exactly. Lots of things on your phone that can help you too. Yeah. Great point. Well, Michael, as always, so fun to talk to you. I'm leaving with so many great ideas that I'm planning on applying. And please let the listeners and viewers know where they can go to find out more about you and everything you do online. 
Yeah, if you're interested in the stuff for writers that I've got, you can find me at authorlevelup.com. Got a YouTube channel, got lots of books for writers and a blog where I publish my thoughts, what I'm, what's going through my head. And if you're interested in my fiction, you can find me at michaellaron.com. Great, thank you. Thanks, Maddie.